to be here and particularly to know that I'm in the company of Lee Smolin, a physicist I deeply admire, and Lisa Randall. So thank you very much for coming tonight. I know you've all had a very long day. Um, my talk tonight, as Mary said, is a story of hyperbolic space linking corals and the cosmos. But I'd like to begin by just taking a few minutes to explain how I come to be here. My career has been rather unusual. The project that I do, which I'll be talking about tonight, is at the intersection of science, mathematics, art, and environmentalism. And all of these things have been a part of the trajectory that I've been on in my desire to communicate science to the public. My own path began when I myself went to university and studied physics. And originally, I thought I would become a research physicist. Physici physics remains probably the greatest love of my life. But ultimately, after six years of university, I decided that what I wanted to do was to become a science communicator. And in the course of the past 30 years, I've pretty much done every form of science communication that one can imagine, from writing books to doing a huge amount of journalism, producing and writing television programs, interactive media. But these days, I find myself primarily working doing exhibitions which are primarily um, exhibited, to my surprise, in art galleries, although all of them are basically based on ideas from mathematics and science. One of the things that I have been concerned with throughout my career is to try to make science and math accessible by placing them in a wider cultural context. So I'm interested particularly in the ways in which science influences the wider culture and the ways in which, in turn, the wider culture influences science itself. So one of my early books was a book called Pythagoras' Trousers, which is a cultural history of physics that also particularly looks at how physics has been um, entwined with religious ideas. So the fact that people like Stephen Hawking talk about the mind of God is not something new. It's been part of the history of physics since its very inception. Uh, another book that I've written, which is relevant to tonight's discussion, is a book called The Pearly Gates of Cyberspace, which is actually the name of the last chapter of the book. The real subject of the book, it's a history of Western concepts of space from the Middle Ages to the internet. And what the book looks at is the history of how physicists have come to conceive of the spatial construct in which we humans conceive ourselves to exist. And I'll be talking a little bit more about that in the talk uh, later on. One of my commitments when I made the decision to become a science communicator was that I very much wanted to speak about science and reach about science to non-canonical audiences. And what I mean by that is people who would probably never become subscribers to the magazines that everybody in this room loves and which I love, things like Scientific American or New Scientist. And you probably are aware that the audience for science um, magazines and science articles and science programs is a fairly small sector of our society. In a nutshell, it's well-off white men over 40. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. That's not a value judgment. It's just a statistical fact. And it's true in Australia. It's true in Britain. And it's true in the US. It's true, true throughout the Anglo world. I don't know if it's true in the non-Anglo world. But I made a commitment when I, want, when I decided to become a science communicator that my primary goal would be to try to reach the people who never would probably subscribe to a science magazine. And one of the audiences I particularly wanted to reach was women. And so one of the things that I'm very proud of in my career is once I left university and decided to become a science journalist, I, this was in Australia 30 years ago, and there was no such thing as a job in science journalism in Australia in those days. So I had to create them. I had to create my own work. And I talked Vogue magazine into letting me write a regular column about science and technology for them. 
And for 10 years in Australia, I actually wrote regular columns about science and technology for three women's magazines, including Vogue and Australian L. And this is something that probably doesn't get a lot of kudos in the science world in general, or even in the science communication world. But as I like to say to people, it's actually much harder to write an article about cosmology for Vogue than it is to write for the New York Times. And the reason for that is because when you write for something like a science magazine or the New York Times, you can assume that your audience has some familiarity with the basic terminology. But when you write for a magazine like Vogue, opposite my article, where there was going to be an, probably an article about skirt lengths or haircuts, and often even it was, I actually had the experience once where I had an article about cosmology and across the page there was an article about blue eyeshadow. And it's actually no easy task to actually keep an audience engaged who might actually think that the words cosmology and cosmetics are intertwined. So this is just by way of saying that throughout my career I've really tried to do things differently. And about 10 years ago, I decided that we really needed to do things differently. As a science communicator, I felt that there was just this terrible gap between what we thought we were doing, which is communicating to the general public, and what we were actually doing, which was communicating to relatively small sectors. And so I decided that I wanted to have a framework for doing science communication in a really different way. And it seemed to me that the only way I could do that was basically to invent the frame myself. So I put up a sign saying Institute for Figuring and with the belief that what I could do was present science and mathematics by giving people an opportunity to literally play with ideas. Now, those of you in the audience who have some computer background might recognise that the acronym of our organisation, IFF, is the logical symbol for if and only if. And the way that I like to think of this organisation is that it's a play tank. So you know how in our society we have things called think tanks? and people come together and they think big ideas and they write opinion pieces and they write books and that's all wondrous. But I believe that also what we need is play tanks, people where, places where people can come to play with ideas. The, I started the IFF with my twin sister Christine and I come from a science background and she's my identical twin and when we left school I went into science and did physics and math at university and she went to art school and became a painter. And she basically informed my thinking to a very large degree because her practice as an artist is to do stuff, to get, to get out there with your hands and muck about and do stuff. And of course that's what a lot of scientists do. We're physicists. Physics is about the physical world. And so the IFF has the concept that what we want to do is give people a chance to play with ideas from mathematics and science. And so I'm just showing you some pictures of some exhibitions that we have had. And you see here, we used to have a fabulous exhibition space of our own, and that FIG is our logo, so FIG. And w one of the great things about the word figuring is that it constitutes art, science, and, so, and mathematics. Figures are numbers. Figures are di scientific diagrams in books. We all have figures. Artists do figurative drawing, and of course, we figure things out. So the word figuring constitutes what we're trying to do, which is to bridge all of these interdisciplinary realms. Now, one of, what, so what, the IFF does, practically speaking, is we put on workshops, we host exhibitions, we um, host lectures with scientists and mathematicians. But increasingly what we're known for is doing large-scale participatory programming. And one of the subject areas that has been key 
to the work I do with the IFF, and in fact key to all of my work, is that I'm extremely interested in concepts of space. And what, how do we conceive of space, and particularly in the age of physics, how have we come to conceive of space in the way that physicists do now? You know, it's a non-trivial question, how did we get here? In the Middle Ages, people didn't conceive of space the way we do today. How did we come to see space in the way that we do now? And as many of you know, more you don't need me to tell you, that physics has conceived of the, of the world as a Euclidean realm. Now, just for, forget about what you know about string theory at the moment, but essentially for most of the history of modern physics since the, the early, late 16th, early 17th century, what we've done is conceive of the space that we're surrounded by as a big Euclidean void. You know, it has three dimensions. And that was the conception of space that really came into being with the Renaissance. And here we have a fabulous articulation of that conception of space by Raphael. This is one of Raphael's famous paintings from the, um, the Sistine Chapel. And you, what you see here is this incredibly beautiful representation that we as humans are embedded in this beautiful, unified, mathematically describable space that is describable through the mathematics that, you, that we get from Euclid. And this uh, down there in the, the bottom right-hand corner of the image, we see Euclid and his students basically inventing contemporary or modern geometry. And it was, Euclid invented um, Euclidean geometry about two and a half thousand years ago. But it wasn't until the 17th century that people, scientists, came to conceive that the world itself could be describable by Euclidean geometry. And that idea begins to be articulated, in fact, in the late Middle Ages, as early as the 13th century. And this image here I find really remarkable. Um, this was actually done by Paolo Uccello in about 14 sorry, about 1420. And what he's trying to do here is show us how you can represent physical objects through a mathematically describable method, which is what we come, come to know as perspective. But that idea was actually articulated in the, as early as the 13th century by one of the great founders uh, or early champions of mathematical science, Roger Bacon. And before the term perspective came into being, Bacon actually had a gorgeous term. He called it geometric figuring. And so this diagram actually um, comes from, it looks like something that was done through early computer graphics or even contemporary computer graphics, but it was actually done more than 500 years ago. And this was uh, the beginnings of people coming to think that everything around them could be described through a mathematical method, that mathematics was indeed, as Galileo put it, the language in which God, in which God had described and invented and articulated the universe. Now, mathematics is a very, very powerful language. And we came to believe in the Renaissance that the world around us was ipso facto Euclidean because the Euclidean method was so powerful, and as we see here from Paolo Uccello's work, so incredibly descriptive of the world. But there are actually other ways of thinking about space and, that are not Euclidean. And I want to show you um, a clip from a film that you've probably all seen. It's um, called Avatar by... Um, James Cameron, and it articulates another conception of space, which is actually one that's far more, as it were, natural. Now, I just have to make one qualifying remark here. Um, th the film you're about to see is, is a bit of Avatar. I don't own the rights to it, but um, I just want to show it to you, so please don't anybody put it up on the internet. That, But I think James Cameron would, 
would be very happy to have this discussed by physicists. Um, ah, sorry, I have to... Uh, uh, before we show James Cameron's film, I just wanted to show you a couple of more pictures of how powerful the Euclidean mode of representing the world can be and how graceful and, as it were, in some sense, um, true to reality it seems. You know, these are images from the Renaissance, but here we go, this is, this is Rome and this is um, a modern American city, and you see we build the world in Euclidean ways. But as I said, there are other ways of conceiving of space, and James Cameron has shown us one of these in his fabulous film, Avatar. Storm, you've contaminated the sample with your saliva. Right. What you're actually seeing here is So those wondrous flowers that you were seeing, which are created using geometric modeling techniques that rely on is the same kind of mathematics that were being used by prospective painters um, 500 years ago. Those flowers are actually representations of hyperbolic geometry. And here we have a real actual thing from nature. It, this is actually a sea sponge that is hyperbolic geometry. And it turns out that while mathematicians and physicists have been, or our physicists have been describing the world in Euclidean terms for 500 years, there's actually very few things in nature that are Euclidean. And in fact, nature has a love affair with another kind of geometry, which is hyperbolic geometry. And it turns out that particularly in the sea, there are tons and tons of hyperbolic things coral reefs, all those frilly crenellated things that we see in coral reefs, they are natural biological manifestations of hyperbolic structures. And it's a very interesting thing that nature has actually had a love affair with hyperbolic structures for at least four or 500 million years. Now, human mathematicians spent hundreds of years trying to prove that hyperbolic space was impossible, or that anything like that was impossible. Yet here's a couple of creatures who've never heard about the impossibility of hyperbolic surfaces, and they're merely getting on with it. So nature actually realizes hyperbolic structures in many, many marine organisms, but also in lots of vegetable things. Lettuces, all those frilly, curly surfaces on lettuces, their variations of hyperbolic structures. And lots of cactuses have hyperbolic structures. So pretty much anywhere in nature where you see those frilly, curly structures, they're biological manifestations of an alternative to Euclidean concepts of being. Here we see another kind of hyperbolic structure. This is a very interesting one. This kind of cactus, which is doing that hyperbolic stuff at the top, what that is, what actually creates that incredibly beautiful structure is actually a kind of planned cancer. It's a kind of the cells have gone wild and you get this kind of pathological structure. And it's interesting when I, I use the word pathological very specifically because when mathematicians first encountered hyperbolic geometry in the late 16th century and then going on, sorry, the late 18th century and going into the 19th century, they actually thought it was pathological. It didn't seem to them that hyperbolic structures made sense. It was literally to them a defiance 
of what reason should be because reason was allied with Euclidean geometry. And here is a quote from one of the mathematicians who first encountered hyperbolic space and hyperbolic geometry at the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century. For God's sake, he says, please give it up. Fear it no less than the sensual passions, because it too may take up all your time and deprive you of your health, happiness, and peace of mind. Now, this is not the kind of high... We're not used to thinking about mathematics or mathematical descriptions of the world in terms of this kind of, you know, emotional hyperbole. So why would mathematicians, why would anything mathematical evoke such a strong and negative and potentially insane-making reaction? So I want to sort of take you through a little bit of what hyperbolic geometry is in a mathematical sense to explain why it is that anyone would think it was pathological, and also to lead us into a deeper question, which is, if these things, if these other mathematical geometries are possible, theoretically speaking, it ultimately leads to a question, what might be the geometry of the space around us? And is the geometry of the space around us Euclidean or not? So you guys are all teaching physics, so I'm sure I can go through this relatively quickly. Usually when I give this talk, I'm giving it to non-scientists, and at this point I always stop and ask a question. And I say, would you like me to do the math or not? And I've never, ever had an audience say anything, but no, 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 we must do the math. And the reason that I say that so excitedly is because one of the things that this exhibits to me is that there is a world of people out there who are hungry to engage with mathematics and physics and desperately want this, but they need ways in that are accessible to them. And one of the things that I have learned in the work that I do is that if you give people beautiful, sensual ways into math and physics, they can't get enough of it. So... Because you are or you teach this stuff, we can go through it fairly quickly. So, as I've said, we started off understanding Euclidean geometry, but there are two other kinds of geometries, and that's spherical geometry and hyperbolic geometry. And let's just deal with for a little bit what these three different geometrical structures are. So... One way of looking at it that mathematicians um, can characterise these structures is that Euclidean space is flat. It has no curvature, it just kind of flat goes on forever. Spherical space, and I should say at this point, I want you to just to think about um, a two-dimensional surface. So a Euclidean space, just like a flat piece of paper, it goes on forever, it has zero curvature. A spherical space, a spheric, like think of the outside of a beach ball, has positive curvature. And it makes sense, doesn't it, if there's something which has positive curvature, then it kind of makes sense intuitively that there should be something that has negative curvature. So just like we had, first of all, zero, and then the positive numbers, and then eventually mathematicians realise, well, if there are positive numbers, there could be something called negative numbers. So it turns out, if we can have positive curvature space, we can have negative curvature space. So hyperbolic geometry can be conceived of as the geometric equivalent of negative numbers. Now, that's partly what drove mathematicians mad. What does it possibly mean to talk about a geometric equivalent of a negative number? So... One way that math mathematicians have numbers of ways of characterising this, but one way is to look at the behaviour of parallel lines. And you all know this. Euclid, one way of characterising Euclidean geometry is to describe the way that, parallel, that lines behave in relation to each other. And the most famous characterisation of this is through what's called Euclid's parallel postulate, and you all know 
that if we have a line and a point outside the line, that there's only one line that I can draw through the point that never reaches, that never touches the original line. So, and that's the lines that we call parallel. Now, Euclid proposed 2,500 years ago that you could never have, a, there could never be a possibility that there would be more than one line that would go through the point and never touch the original line because any other line would ipso facto be slanted and that they would intersect. But from the beginning, mathematicians were a bit worried by this proposition because they thought it's a bit of a mouthful to say all of that. If it's so true, if it's so ipso facto true, as Euclid said, shouldn't we be able to prove it was true? And actually, people started trying to prove it was true very, very early on. Now, to give you an idea that there's a problem here, we ha think about what you know about the surface of a sphere. Think of a, think, imagine a beach ball. And so I'm going to ask the question on the surface of a beach ball. If I have a beach ball and I draw a line on it and I draw a point, how many lines, how many straight lines are there that go through the point and never meet the original line? Now, this raises a very deep question because now we have to think about what do we mean by talking about a straight line in a curved space? And as you all know, mathematicians have determined a general answer to this. In any kind of a curved, in any curved surface, the straightest lines, the straight lines are the ones that are the shortest. And on the surface of a sphere, the shortest lines are the great circles like the equator and the lines of longitude. So, big question. Now that you know this, this how many straight lines are there that I could draw through the point that never meet an original straight line? Zero, exactly. Because on the surface of the sphere, like on the surface of the Earth, with the lines of the, with the equator and the lines of longitude, they all intersect. So now we have a question where one answer is zero and one answer is one. So that raises the possibility, if there's two answers to our question, perhaps there's another answer. And mathematicians actually spent hundreds of years trying to prove that there wasn't any un other answer. And in the in the um, process of doing that, they actually finally became convinced that there is indeed another answer, and the answer is infinity. So, and that is what's called hyperbolic space. So in hyperbolic space, I can ask the question, if I take an original line and I take a point outside the line, how, there are an infinite number of straight lines that I can draw through the point that never meet the original line. And that's what it looks like. Now, you're all sitting there saying, I'm cheating. And everyone who sees this diagram thinks the same thing. I'm cheating because those lines are curved. But the reason those lines are curved, is, or look curved, is only because I'm trying to project an image of a curved surface onto a flat onto a flat plane. It's exactly the same as if I'm trying to project an image of the surface of the Earth, which is a spherical space, onto a flat surface, which is what's called a map, then something has to get distorted. So we all know that a flat map doesn't look like, it distorts distances, it doesn't really look like what the countries look like on the surface of the Earth. And so too, that's true with hyperbolic space. So at the beginning of the 19th century, mathematicians became convinced that, logically speaking, there was a surface that had this quality, where there was an infinite number of lines you could draw through a point that never meet the original line, and they were all straight. And that's why they nearly went mad, because it didn't seem to make sense. And they didn't have a physical model of what this looked like. And actually, they didn't have a physical model of it, that they could really contemplate 
until 1997, when a woman named Dr. Dinah Tamina, who's a mathematician computer scientist at Cornell, came along and said, you know what, I can do this with crochet. And not only can I crochet models of hyperbolic geometry, with these lovely curly frilly things that look like sea creatures, but I can stitch mathematical theorems onto them and I can prove to you that Euclid was wrong. And so here we have a crocheted model of a hyperbolic surface and here we have Euclid's postulate drawn in, sorry, um, sewed in thread and this is, ex this is proof that Euclid was wrong, done in a feminine handicraft. And so here we have one line, and here we have the points outside the line, a point, and we have three lines going through it, and none of them meet the original line. And that looks curved, but that's again because I'm trying to project it into a flat space, the room around. But I can prove to you that those lines are straight because I can, what I can do is I can fold them. And that's a physical proof, that's physics. <laughs> that's a physical proof that Euclid is wrong. And it's done with yarn and a crochet hook. And you can stitch all kinds of theorems onto these surfaces. You can show, you can stitch triangles and, and prove by looking at the triangles that in hyperbolic surfaces, that the angles of a triangle don't add up to 180 degrees, they add up to less than 180 degrees. You can stitch um, a point and then stitch a circle around it, and you can prove, you can demonstrate by measuring it, that on a hyperbolic surface, that the circumference of a circle is more than 2 pi r. And so here we have in yarn and handicraft, a powerful way of demonstrating mathematical principles. And one of the things that I love about this is that as soon as mathematicians realised that there were other geometric structures possible other than Euclidean, it immediately raised the question, well, if other things are mathematically possible, what's physically possible? What's physically realised? And as early as the very beginning of the 19th century, Gauss asked himself, is it possible that the universe is a hyperbolic structure? And we still don't know the answer to that. One of the biggest questions that things like the Hubble Space Telescope are trying to answer is what is the geometric structure of the universe on the large scale? Most of the, most of the evidence that we are getting suggests that on the large scale, the universe is Euclidean. But there is some evidence that we might just live in a hyperbolic world. And isn't that wonderful? Of course, if we live in a hyperbolic universe, we know from general relativity that it will be a four-dimensional structure. We have the three dimensions of space, and as you know, relativity says that time is another dimension of reality. So. Our hyperbolic structure, if, it ex if the universe is a hyperbolic structure, it will be in four dimensions rather than two. But who would have possibly imagined that there could have been a link between what sea slugs are doing and what the structure of reality might be? And it's not just corals and sea slugs that are making hyperbolic surfaces. Here are some calla lilies that are hyperbolic structures, just like those structures that we saw in the James Cameron clip. And I once had a wonderful discussion on an airplane with a young woman who she and I were both crocheting together on the plane. And it turned out that she was a physicist doing her PhD on how these flowers actually make hyperbolic surfaces. And it turned out that for the physicists, her team of physics, physics, physicists at the University of Texas in Austin, they were actually modeling 
how flowers make these hyperbolic structures. And as physicists, in order to make these models, they had to do it in four dimensions. And so I asked the question that I can't possibly answer, but isn't it interesting? We humans have to do this by modeling on supercomputers in four dimensions, but how does the calla lily do it? And does it mean that in some sense the calla lily knows hyperbolic geometry? I put that out there as a question to you. There is another way of, de of describing hyperbolic, or the, the three geometric structures, hyperbolic, Euclidean, and spherical, and I'll just show it to you very quickly because I want to um, show you another instance of the, the wondrousness of physics in, and math in the real world. So another way we can explain the difference between the three geometries is how you can what's called tessellate the space. So you all know that you can fill a Euclidean space, like your bathroom floor, with hexagons. If I want to make a model of a spherical structure, I take away some of the hexagons and replace them with pentagons, and you all know what this is. So if I want to make um, a hyperbolic structure, what do you think I do? Heptagons, yes. I take some of the hexagons and I replace them with seven-sided pentagons. So with the spherical structure, by literally taking away some sides, by replacing some six-sided ones with five-sided ones, I pull the structure in on itself and, as, and make it closed. But when, if I replace that and I add some more sides, I'm literally adding in space and I get these beautiful... Um, open curly forms. And you can do these, you can actually make these with paper models and uh, you can go on the IFF website and download um, a template for this and it's really fun to do it with kids or college students or anybody really to make these beautiful hyperbolic structures out of paper. You just, you know, cut and glue. But, you know, they're, they're fiddly to make and they, they don't last very long and, and really crochet is the way to go. But, uh, you know, because crochet is so easy and it's durable and it's really flexible, whereas these are very fiddly. Now, I asked, uh, last year, it suddenly occurred to me, is there anything in nature that does this? Is there anything in nature that makes, that emulates these three geometric structures, these lattice-like forms of modelling these three different kinds of geometric forms? And it, I discovered, to my amazement, that there is something in nature that actually does all these forms. And does anyone here want to take a guess what you think it might be? Sorry? Someone said it. Uh, no, co corals do the form, but, but, but what I'm asking specifically is these three... Like, this is a model of the form. It's not a continuous curly thing. It's these, like these, think of the networks. Carbon. carbon. That is exactly right. So carbon comes in all three geometric forms. So carbon sheets, which is what graphite is, and, and now um, we know how to make big sheets of, of, of carbon, mole sorry, carbon atoms in a, in a uh, six-sided tessellation. And that's what graphene is, which is a new material that is revolutionising everything, going to revolutionise everything from microchips to, you know, how we make cars. And it can, sheets of graphene can be wrapped into nanotubes. And about 15 years ago, chemists discovered that there was a soccer ball version of carbon, which is called buckyballs after Buckminster Fullerene. And this also is a new material that's revolutionising many, many industries. But I discovered that it turns out that there is a hyperbolic version of the carbon that does this. Some Australian scientists discovered a few years ago that there is a hyperbolic version of carbon, so it makes, like, that structure on the right, and it does it in carbon at the microscopic scale, and it's called carbon nanofoam. Nobody knows what it is, what, I don't think anyone's got a use for it yet. But isn't that incredible? Mathematicians spend hundreds of years trying to prove that these structures were impossible. And here we have carbon atoms doing it 
at the microscopic level. Now, it turns out when you make the crochet versions of these structures, you follow a very simple algorithm. And basically, the algorithm is just crochet n stitches increase 1. So you can crochet three stitches increase 1, and then keep going, three, crochet three increase 1, crochet three increase 1. Or you can do it every four or every five, or any number at all. As long as you crochet at, with an increase rate that is consistent, you get a mathematically perfect structure, like this one is that I can use to demonstrate mathematical principles, or like this lovely thing is here. Excuse me, I've got a slight bit of hay fever. Um, so if you want to make a mathematically perfect one and show it to your geometry students, you follow this very simple algorithm crochet in, increase one. But it turns out that if, like my sister Christine, who's an artist, you get sick of the formula and you wake up one day and say, oh, I'm sick of the formula, I'm going to branch out, and you start playing with it, you can get this huge taxonomy of different forms. So nature doesn't feel compelled to do anything mathematically pure. So just as you know, there are lots of things in nature that are sphere-like, but there's nothing, there's nothing in nature that's a perfect sphere, is there? But we have eggs and sea urchins, you know, wonky spheres. So in nature, there's nothing that's perfectly hyperbolic. You know, it's a bit more frilly on this side and a bit less frilly on that side, or maybe, you know, it's a bit flatter over here and a bit curlier over here. And so this is what nature does. Nature doesn't care about mathematical perfection. Nature just interested in feeding itself or moving towards the sunlight. And so my sister and I started playing, and we started branching out from the mathematical formula. Maybe we crochet one in every three, uh, increase one in every three for a while, then one in every four. And what we began to realise is that just as um, that basically, if you didn't stick to the pure math, these things began to look a lot more organic because that's actually what nature is doing. And my sister started branching out particularly and doing these wonky ones. And we had a few of them sitting on our coffee table after she'd been doing them for about a week. And we looked at them and we thought, oh my gosh, it looks like a coral reef. And we uttered the phrase, we could crochet a coral reef. And that was in Christmas in 2005. And I put um, up a notice on the IFF website inviting other people who might want to crochet a coral reef with us. And to my astonishment, 10 years later, I'm still crocheting a coral reef. And first of all, it took over the living room, then it took over the house, and then it took over my life. And what happened is that as it were, both Chrissy and I, and now thousands of people around the world who've participated in doing this with us, have been, as it were, together exploring a crochet tree of life, a kind of mathematical, it's a, it's a mathematical experiment about what you can actually do with using a mathematical seed, hyperbolic geometry, and then branching out and playing with it and going viral and feral. It's a project that, for that reason, is equally at the nexus of mathematics and science, art and craft. And to date, over the past 10 years, we've had 8,000 people in more than a dozen countries in 35 cities across the world do this, in the, across the USA, Australia, the UK, Europe, and we recently did it in the United Arab Emirates. And what happens is that we have, Chrissy and I go and give talks about this and teach workshops, and then hundreds and sometimes up to a thousand people get involved in making a crochet coral reef in their own city. And these get exhibited in art galleries and science museums. It happens to be the case that almost always it's art galleries rather than science museums 
that invite us to do this, which is something that pretty much surprised us. We thought it would be the opposite, that it would be the science museums, but it's primarily been art galleries. But what happens in the exhibitions is that during the course of teaching people to do this, we also teach them about geometry. So I go through, like I've gone through with you, what's the math behind this? The project is timely, and I think, excuse me, the project is timely, and one of the reasons I think it's elicited such a response is because it's also an artistic response to global warming. So as you all know, reefs are being devastated by global warming, and the proof of that is that right now, as we speak, reefs all over the world are showing these enormous bleaching events, which are signs that the corals are stressed and sick. So the bleaching of coral reefs is proof that global warming is not in the future, it's here and now, and we need to respond. To date, more than two million people have seen our exhibitions, and all of them have been exposed to the fact that underlying nature and these wonderful forms is mathematics. This is physics in action, physics in joy, and physics in beauty. The people, I said earlier that 8,000 people have been involved in doing these to date, all around the world. I should say that of those people, to my surprise, 99.99% of them have been women people. And we can discuss in the question time afterwards, if you like, why that might be. It has surprised us. Chrissy and I imagined that if this project ever took off, it would reach that probably more women than men, but we expected a large number of men to have been participating too. But it has been almost all women. And I'm very, very thrilled to say that I believe it is probably the world's largest art and science project in terms of the sheer number of participants. And I'm very proud of the fact that through this lovely feminine handicraft, that we found a way to engage so many women with mathematics and therefore the, the idea that mathematics underlies nature. Just to give you some idea of how huge and beautiful thing, these things can be, this was from an exhibition that we had um, a year or so ago in Abu Dhabi. Um, some of you will have seen, and if you, any of you want to look up more about this, I gave a talk uh, a TED talk about this in 2009, which I think is what brought the AAPT here to me. Um, and anyone who would like to know more about the project, we have published a book about it, which looks at the maths and the science and the physics and the environmentalism and the art behind the project. I'd just like to end by saying that what has surprised me about this project more than anything is the fact that in our society we're used to thinking of women doing crochet and handicrafts over here, people studying nature and marine biology over there, and the physicists studying the foundations of reality over here. And what I like about this project is that it suggests that all of these things are related and combined, and that perhaps these disciplinary divides that we have in our society aren't necessarily as hard as they need to be. So thanks very much. Oh, and I realize it's almost 8.30, but if we, we're, we can stay for a little bit if people would like to have comments and questions, and I'm sure you will have fabulous comments. Do we have microphones at all? Questions? I'm sorry. Hello. So my first reaction isn't uh, a question or something about physics, but 
uh, where can I get some to wear? <laughs> Very good question. So let me show you something astounding. Oh, well, here's something. So um, this is um, a, a mathematically precise one. It's made out of, it's done in beading. And this woman, Sue Olson, um, beaded a number of these for us. But also, I'd like to show you, here we go. Look, fashion designers have discovered hyperbolic surfaces too. So that's done with pleating. That's an, that's an Italian fashion designer, but it's just, it's done with pleating. And we were thrilled some years ago to find that Bjork had clearly been looking at our website. And here she was wearing a hyperbolic out, crocheted outfit. You can make one. <laughs> Sorry, I can't see with the lights. I noticed, I noticed that you didn't mention pottery and things like saddle-shaped uh, curves on pottery or saddles themselves. Oh, well, hyperbolic surfaces, um, uh, a saddle which go kind of curves like that and like that um, is a hyperbolic surface. And that, so... Some, sometimes when people are trying to describe hyperbolic surfaces, they start with the example of a saddle. Um, we usually start with corals. <laughs> Other questions? Oh, then can we thank our speaker again, please? Thank you very much.